Hello and welcome to the Europe Show. Today we are in Nemur in Wallonia, the Francophone region of Belgium, a country at the heart of the European project. But here, like in many other EU member states, there are strong concerns regarding the international free trade deals agreed between Brussels and other parts of the world. In this edition, we'll be bringing you reports from Belgium, France, Tunisia and Brazil to try to understand what impact these free trade deals might have on the farming world, but also on the economy. David Claraval, hello. You are Belgium's agriculture minister, a country of some 36,000 farms. Uh, give us, please, an overview of the sector. What do you export the most? Above all, we export meat. In the Flemish region, it's mostly pork, and 70% of the production is exported. In the south, in Wallonia, it's mostly beef, like here with the Bleu Blanc Belge breed that is behind us, which is a typical breed in this region. Then we produce a lot of dairy. On top of that, there is a lot of vegetables, especially potatoes, and then a great deal of cereal crops. So those are our four major sectors. On top of that, and this might come as a surprise, but there's also cocoa, chocolate, because we export a great deal of chocolate, although we don't grow the cocoa beans in Belgium, of course. The famous Belgian chocolate. Uh, there are clear differences between uh, Flanders and the Walloon region. Flanders, there's about two-thirds of the country's farms. Uh, and that means also that maybe the regions don't perceive international trade deals the same way. The Flemish region has a great deal more intensive farming, which exports a lot of its produce. The Wallonia region is more the opposite, with extensive farming. So the two regions don't really have the same vision when it comes to trade deals that are agreed with other countries. We've seen in the past, for example, that the Wallonia region blocked the CETA deal with Canada because they thought it would penalize their economy. In the end, we did manage to find a compromise to unblock the situation, but it shows that there are really two different agricultural policies in Belgium. You just mentioned that the Walloon region managed to block the CETA. Do you think uh, the Walloon region will block the Mercosur deal between Europe and South America. There is a great deal of concern, especially in Wallonia. We have to be very careful that if we do enter into this trade deal, our farmers are put on the same level playing field as the agricultural sector on the other side of the Atlantic. Let's not mess around. Let's be clear about this. On the wider scale, from my position as an economic liberal, the Mercosur deal will be beneficial for Belgium because we will be able to sell more cars and more pharmaceuticals. But for our farmers, it won't be so positive. So the Belgian position has to take into account both sides. We aren't opposed to the deal, but our farmers need to be protected from unfair competition. And you've said you want fairer prices for uh, cattle farmers like here in the Walloon region. How do you do that? That's something that has to happen at the European level. If this deal is agreed, then clauses that protect our farmers must be part of the negotiations and part of the deal itself. As Agriculture Minister, is it hard sometimes to make your country's interests coincide with those of neighbouring nations and of other EU member states? There must be a bit of friction and tensions at time. Farming is totally different everywhere you go across Europe. But little by little, we are seeing there is a sort of re-nationalization of certain countries' agricultural policies. And we're seeing that some countries are beginning to prioritize their individual farm sectors rather than helping build a better collaboration. David Claraval, thank you very much. We now have for you a report by Luke Brown, who went to meet farmers worried that hormone-fed beef will be imported from South America in large quantities, that it will be unfair competition. He also met with farmers, on the other hand, very excited by the prospect of exporting tons of French fries from here, Belgium, a speciality. Take a look. In the fields of Wallonia, Belgium's green gold is in bloom. Here it's potatoes as far as the eye can see. Five million tons of spuds are harvested each year, with exports worth 2 billion euros annually. 
Belgium is at the heartland of potato country. So we have the best soil and the best climate. We are world leader in frozen potato products. Uh, for a small country like this, that's, that's quite an achievement. The vast majority of Belgium's potatoes are reserved for frozen chips. Indeed, frozen spuds represent a third of all Belgium's agri-food exports to Latin America. The sector sees huge potential in the EU's free trade deal with the Mercosur region. We have a, we have a tariff uh, up until now from 14% of every uh, sack of frozen potatoes we, we import in, uh, in the Mercosur countries. And if that tariff falls, that gives us, of course, uh, the advantage. But while the potato industry celebrates, other farming sectors are less enthusiastic. The Mercosur deal will allow a quota of 160,000 tonnes of beef into Europe with reduced tariffs. For beef farmers like Laurent Gaumont, who rears the prestigious Bleu Blanc Belge breed, that's a serious threat. They're threatening to bring into Europe a considerable quantity of meat, but at prices that are really a lot lower than ours. But our prices are higher due to lots of environmental and social demands that we have to abide by and which aren't respected in other countries. In Belgium, the big winners of the Mercosur deal would be industries like the pharmaceutical sector. And farmers like Laurent believe agriculture is being thrown under the bus. These deals are really aimed at permitting trade links between big companies and big structures. It's complete nonsense to bring this meat across the ocean, especially when we're perfectly able to produce it here. The poultry sector also has beef, so to speak, with the Mercosur deal faced with tariff-free imports. But for the Walloon Farmers Union, the imports are not the only problem. EU farmers have to respect increasingly tough and sometimes costly green rules, while Mercosur countries have little incentive to improve. It makes sense to work on the sustainability of our sector. The ambitions are huge and farmers are ready to achieve them. But we must not face competition from imports from areas of the world where the ambitions are exactly the opposite. The Belgian region of Wallonia also delayed the EU's trade deal with Canada in 2016 over concerns for its agriculture. For the region's president, Ilio de Rupo, the political necessity to strike a deal must not outweigh the costs to European principles. Everyone says it's important on a geostrategic level. Perhaps, but we want a balance with respect for minimum social, environmental and health norms. How can we explain to a beef farmer in Europe that we're going to import meat that doesn't respect those rules, or while the European Union demands massive efforts of our farmers? It's not possible. Agriculture represents less than 3% of Belgium's total exports to Mercosur. Fearing their voices could be drowned out, farmers are continuing their calls to protect European food production. We are now at the Mehegnul farm in the Walloon region. People have been growing vegetables and working this earth since the 13th century. Across history, uh, it developed a network of customers, of course in Belgium, but also abroad. And we're going to discuss international trade deals between the EU and other blocs with you, Joao Pacheco. Hello. Hi. You've been working in this field, international trade agreements, for the past 30 years. You were at one point the EU's ambassador uh, to Brazil. Uh, tell me about the Mercosur deal between the EU and South American nations. What is the situation? What are the current terms of the deal? The deal has not as yet been ratified because there, are, there is a strong opposition in the European Parliament and in some member states. What are the concerns? Can this be a win-win situation, as some people have been putting it? Depends on your perspective, depends on your interests. It's clear that in the industrial area, in services, Europe will win. Even in agriculture, sectors like wine, we are in the middle of a vineyard, uh, cheeses, uh, processed products of high quality. but. And that's a big but. 
sectors like the beef sector, pork, uh, poultry, sugar, they will face competition from the most competitive countries in the world. And so what is the EU trying to do to protect those six sectors at risk? I think that's one of the problems. The honest answer is nothing. Uh, other than the support through the common agriculture policy, there is no specific targeted support for the sectors that we lose under a free trade agreement. And tell me, the EU is trying to uh, put in place strict rules uh, such as uh, imports from South America uh, have to respect certain EU standards. We're talking animal welfare. We're talking uh, food standards, quality uh, standards. How do you ensure that? Of course, we have to set the standards, have an agreement on those standards. If we say we don't allow the use of this pesticide, we have to check at our borders that the pesticide has not been used. Is that realistic? Can it be done? It can be done. But the controls perhaps have to be stepped up. But in terms of other standards, for instance, environmental standards, what we are already asking farmers here to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, how are we going to have the same standards being applied in Brazil or in Argentina? One final question. Uh, in these times of COVID-19, with the pandemic, we've seen nations trying to rely a lot more on their own agriculture to feed their own people. Um, with all of this happening, uh, do you think that member states might change the way they see uh, free trade agreements such as Mercosur? I sense that for some member states, after COVID, that's more of an issue. But unfortunately, when I look at the trade review done recently by the European Commission, it appears nowhere. It's still, we all benefit from free trade. And there is no reflection on either food security in Europe or how to compensate the sectors that will be losers. Joel Pacheco, thank you so much. We're now going to go to a country you know extremely well, and that's Brazil. Our correspondent there, Fanny Lothar, has been talking to those who are importing from Europe and those who are exporting to Europe. And how is this Mercosur deal going to change their business? Here's her report. Amid the arid lands of northeastern Brazil, welcome to the farm that defies superlatives. A 7,500 hectare plantation of melon and watermelon. Each year, more than 300,000 tonnes of fruit from here are exported all over the world. Once the European summer is over, more than half will be sold to Holland and England. And it all starts here in these huge greenhouses. Here is a small melon cutting. We plant them one by one. We plant three and a half million cuttings like this every week. The leading exporter of Brazilian melon to Europe, this producer is a fervent supporter of the reduction in customs duties of around 10% provided for in the agreement. Most of the seeds we produce come from Holland. I find it very paradoxical, even absurd, that this agreement has not yet been ratified. I believe there is a lot of protectionism behind all of this. But in the end, it will be very profitable for the population because it will allow us to produce more, to create more jobs, and in Europe, where you produce seeds, pesticides and irrigation systems, you will be able to export more to us. Luis Barcelos' farm is one of the few to comply with European standards for pesticide applications. Brazilian and European standards have been applied here. A requirement of their overseas customers, but an exception in Brazilian agrobusiness, which stands accused of destroying the environment for the benefit of the juicy European market. Look, this is our irrigation system. A small part of the producers who exploit without respecting the law end up tarnishing the image of the whole agribusiness and giving the impression that our whole profession is working illegally when it's not. It's not by turning its back on Brazil and refusing this agreement that deforestation will stop. On the contrary, it'll get worse. 
For this University of Sao Paulo researcher who moved to Belgium after receiving threats, the agreement could have a negative impact on good agricultural practices. Those who will benefit the most are the large landowners. Some properties have been acquired legally, but many others illegally. The trend is expansive. The more exports increase, the more the size of the plantations will have to increase, eating into areas that are not yet cultivated. According to her report, more than 6 million kilos of pesticides manufactured in Europe but banned in Europe would be exported each year to Mercosur. And much more if the agreement were to be ratified. But Europe would benefit from the protection for its AOP and IGP labels. In this department store specialising in the sale of European products, wines, cheeses and other AOC meats see their prices almost double when they arrive here. Suddenly, Brazilians have seen the opportunity. They produce copies, except for one detail. Look, here is a product that is not AOC. Why does it say Tipo here? Because it's not a Brie from France. It's obvious that if the agreement is signed, we could sell more high-quality European products at more affordable prices. In a recent social media appearance, Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro once again criticised the French veto. And with this deal stalled for more than 20 years, Brazil is now increasingly turning towards China. That's it for part one of our Europe show here in Belgium. Thank you all for watching. Join us for part two. We'll be crossing the border into France to talk more about agriculture, free trade agreements, and their impact on the farming world.